Hello and welcome everybody to the uh, Hockey Minds Conference Roundtable. This is the management segment of the conference and uh, we want to first off congratulate uh, Ryan for uh, putting this conference together and, and the success that that podcast has had uh, and the impact it's had on uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people young and old that are trying to get into the, the hockey industry. We were talking just before we started recording here, uh, our panels have been in the top 63 or so episodes and, and Ryan is about to uh, eclipse the, the century mark. So it's uh, it's certainly taken off and he's done a great job with it. So congratulations to him and uh, and thanks so much uh, to him for, for allowing me to be part of this. Uh, my name is Matt Dumichel. I'm uh, currently the Assistant General Manager of the Leamington Flyers in the uh, GOJHL uh, and uh, had been on a, a guest uh, earlier. I had poked uh, Ryan to, um, uh, to see if he'd be interested in telling his story and, and I was fortunate enough to, to get the chance to, to interview him. So uh, he's, uh, he's called on me to interview a couple other uh, outstanding individuals who've had previous episodes. So I'm excited to, to introduce uh, each of them um, and uh, an opportunity to flash back uh, to the episodes that they've been on after enjoying the conference here. Uh, so episode 20, if we go back uh, way back for, for Ryan, almost back to the beginning, uh, he had had uh, Jeff Tui on uh, as his guest there. Uh, Jeff, uh, one of the the Mount Rushmores of the Ontario Hockey League, I'd suggest, as far as management is concerned, um, 20 years plus with the Peterborough Pete, 17 as a, a general manager, uh, working with the Arizona Coyotes and their scouting department, uh, and then also went on to uh, work with the Kingston Frontenacs. Um, so Jeff is is joining us here as well. Jeff, thanks so much for the time. Well, thanks a lot, Matt. You're making me feel old. Actually, like Mount Rushmore is old. So when you when you <laughs> kind of put me in that company, you're probably right. But you know, actually. It was 30 years in Peterborough, so uh, it was. Uh, it's it's, awesome. it's been a long run, but I guess that's just aging myself. But uh, thanks, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Looking forward to it. Yeah, trying to uh, to compliment you on your your career and and then across the, kind of bringing the age into it as well can uh, can be a dangerous thing. So uh, we're excited to have you here, Jeff. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, episode 22 of the Hockey Minds podcast was with Spiros and Astis and uh, Spiros. We had a, a great. Um, time uh, listening to that that podcast certainly again with with your hockey career and and exploring through the uh, ECHL uh, working at the university level um, as well with uh, some international hockey experience and uh, most recently an opportunity to coach in the uh, NWHL um, for yourself well-rounded and, and an awesome opportunity to have you on here as well so I appreciate you taking the time as well. Yeah uh, no thanks for having me and uh, you know my experience and my uh my my pathway doesn't even scratch the surface of the other two guests, but <laughs> I'm honored to be uh, sandwiched in between two uh, respectable veterans. So I'll you're try. You're saying you're younger than us. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeff, I think I think you've been in the game longer than I've been alive, but that's great. <laughs> All right, move on. <laughs> and and our third uh, our third guest here, uh, the assistant GM and director of scouting for the Tri City Americans, Roy Stasiak, and. Uh, Roy, we had mentioned just off of the uh, the beginning here, um, a career that started in uh, in broadcasting and, and in radio and that that entertainment industry, and you had an opportunity to be a, a disc jockey, and and since then have had the chance to work for a number of teams in the WHL, um, worked for the Toronto uh, Maple Leafs as a scout as well, and and have seen uh, any number of um, of angles from the the scouting. Um, realm of, of hockey so very excited to have all three of you at, at different stages of your career and different experiences to to have this conversation and uh, and enlighten the, the people that are watching this uh, as we go along so Roy thanks for joining us thank you my pleasure it's always uh, fun to uh, give back anytime we can and uh, I don't think of myself as old as much as I do experience so <laughs> anything I can uh, add for some young uh, young person that wants to get involved in the game uh, certainly it's my pleasure Excellent. So we'll get right into it then. And Roy, I guess we'll, we'll start with you. Uh, what uh, do you have on your plate right now after uh, obviously a season uh, of hockey across the world that uh, we've never seen before? Um, what uh, types of things uh, have you focused on in the last little bit here and, and what are you gearing towards? Well, this year, we, the Western Hockey League, as uh, some people will know, some won't know, uh, we don't have a 16-year-old draft. We have a 15-year-old draft. So we didn't hold a draft in 2020-21. Uh, so uh, that's going to be postponed until December. So our camp is going to be a lot different than it's been in the past. Uh, we won't have any 15-year-olds at camp. It'll be all 16-year-olds. So it's unique in the sense that everybody who's at camp can actually play full-time this year. 
and uh, there won't be any prospects, 15 year old prospects to look at and recruit for an extra year. So we're getting ready for our training camp. It's gonna be smaller than usual. Uh, when planning for it, we still had the, uh, the effects of the pandemic in mind. So we didn't wanna go overboard and invite a lot of numbers. And I think the game is changing a little bit as well in the fact that uh, I, I really believe major junior hockey is going to take on a, an NCAA look where you actually, you know, identify the players you want, bring them to camp, and go from there, as opposed to bringing a lot of free agents and unlisted players to camp and hold a tryout. Um, the, the amount of teams, the, uh, the quality of the players, uh, there's just not a lot of value in that anymore. So we'll be concentrating on our prospects. And uh, we're looking forward to moving ahead. It's been, you know, uh, a tough couple of years. Uh, two years ago, uh, the COVID shortened season, we were going to miss the playoffs. Uh, this past year, of course, we had a shortened 24 game season, which I was happy for. It gave our, uh, our draft eligible players, you know, a chance to showcase themselves a little bit. So I'm just looking forward to turning the page, getting COVID behind us and uh, moving forward. It's always an exciting time seeing uh, some new faces and uh, mixing those with some great veteran kids we have as well. And Spiros, for yourself, um, not necessarily just the, the COVID, but uh, a turbulent uh, past year for the Brampton Beast, uh, unfortunately um, not having to, uh, uh, to expire that franchise and then getting the opportunity to coach with the Toronto Six in the uh, NWHL. Uh, tell us uh, what uh, you're, you're working on right now uh, and, uh, and where you're, you're um, hoping to land next season. Yeah, well, as you mentioned, it's uh, been a tumultuous year in terms of obviously COVID. Brampton originally opted out with uh, 12 other teams in the ECHL. So that's when the Toronto Six opportunity came about. For me, it was really important to have some kind of semblance of a 2020-21 season. And it was a real great growth and learning opportunity. Uh, so I, I really appreciate it to the Toronto Six and getting that women's experience. And then unfortunately, uh, after the regular season bubble, uh, I found out Brampton was folding operations permanently. So uh, since then, I've been looking for the next stop in my hockey journey. It's a, it's a beautiful one. It's an uncertain one sometimes, as I know the other guests know. Uh, but uh, we've had some real traction here the last couple of weeks, a couple of interviews uh, with other ECHL clubs, uh, a couple with the American Hockey League for assistant uh, roles, and uh, you know a couple of preliminary conversations at the major junior level. So you know, there's three ways that I think this career can can potentially take me in the next year, and I'm excited whichever way it goes. Uh, that's part of the life, and uh, it's an exciting process. <laughs> and, and Jeff, uh, you as well, again, a uh, 30 plus year career in, in junior hockey, you haven't been involved with a, a team specifically in, in the last couple of years. Is that something you're still looking to do, or have you had the uh, the opportunity to uh, to step back and, and kind of change your focus? Well, obviously had the, the chance to, to step back, Matt. Um, I was with Kingston uh, in the 2019-2020 uh, season, just as, as an advisor, just to help them out and uh, really enjoyed that. Just, you know, kind of observing the whole organization was very actively involved in bringing Paul McFarland in there um, to get, you know, the coaching stabilized. And uh, that was something I, I really enjoyed. Um, unfortunately, they let the general manager go, uh, Darren Kiley, and... Uh, you know, my personality, I just couldn't stay there after that happened. So I left in this past season, obviously in Ontario, there hasn't been hockey. So spent a lot of time. And I think you and I've talked a bit, Matt, just, you know, kind of putting things down, putting together my philosophies, uh, uh, building a scouting manual, trying to, you know, stay productive. Um, like Spiros, I've had some, some conversations lately now with some NHL teams and, uh, you know, obviously there's going to be a need for people in Ontario because the OHL looks like it's going to go. So I think there's, there's going to be something going for me uh, in the fall. Um, I've offered, you know, the OHL just, you know, I'm at a point where I'd love just to go back and keep advising, helping. If there's a team out there, I'd love to, to just help. But uh, if not, you know, hopefully there's something in the scouting uh, world for me. And if that doesn't happen, well, I've got two grandsons here in, uh, in Peterborough that I spend a lot of time with and that's okay too. But uh, like the other, you know, the other two guys, like, you know, we're all passionate about the game and uh, it's what we do. It's not about getting paid or, you know, it's just something we're all passionate about. So hopefully there's something out there come the fall, uh, you know, and, and uh, we get back at it because I really miss going to games, you know, looking at players, uh, you know, being part of an organization. So, so looking forward to that. I, it, it's starting, you know, like Spiro said, it's, it's starting to pick up a little bit. So I think there's going to be something there and uh, looking forward to it.
But you know, in the meantime, I've, I've taken a lot of time to self-reflect and try and get better and, and make sure that I've got, you know, my philosophies, my beliefs and everything kind of put together. And um, so there's always, there's, there's been some productivity come out of it as well. That's great. And, and we'll start with, uh, with Jeff and, and go around uh, as well. When you talk about philosophy, obviously something that you would have to have a stronghold on in these types of positions that you're in, general manager, uh, head coach, director of scouting, assistant GM and such. Interested to see how you develop those philosophies uh, as you got started and, and possibly a, a part B to that question is how many times have you seen that philosophy change as, uh, as hockey has changed? So Jeff, we'll start with you on that. Yeah, I, my, my philosophies on building teams have, have, you know, started long ago from watching teams and trying to figure out what made teams successful. And, and uh, my early years in Peterborough, we had a lot of success. We, we had, uh, but, but we had a really clear identity as a team, as an organization, what we looked for in players. Uh, I think a lot of the, the core values that we look for in players still, uh, is still relevant today. Um, I think you've had to change a little bit because, you know, speed and, and, and skill maybe weren't as important 15 years ago as they are now, but at the, at the, the core beliefs in terms of character, um, you know, leadership, the importance of that, the importance of size, grit, competitiveness, I think those were formed with me very early on in Peterborough because we had success with players like that, and I, I don't really know how to do it any other way, and when I see a team like the Islanders playing really hard you know effective defense that's that's what we always did in peterborough roger nielsen stressed that to us very very early on or you see montreal with with a with big defense you know which we always had in peterborough so that just developed over time with me but um and it, and i guess to answer the question matt the changes i've made now is you know much much more um respect for speed skating and hockey sense uh you, you, you know you have to change slightly but again the core values and beliefs have remained the same for many years and Spiros uh, being behind the bench as an assistant coach and you know in, in your career coaching in the NCAA level uh, getting the experience there with Western Michigan and, and then working in Grand Rapids going through the ECHL and, and seeing the different levels of hockey uh, opportunities that you've had as a head coach where did you find uh, the the philosophy or, or how you developed what you would want a team to look like and and uh, getting to, to see that on the women's side as well must have been uh, an, an interesting introduction for you. Yeah, well, it's it's uh, I've I've accumulated a lot of great experiences, and more importantly, worked with some really great people. And and we're in a profession of thievery, really. Like we we kind of take our stuff from everyone, and our mentors kind of mold us into who we are. And then the trick is making it your own and being able to to teach it, uh, you know, efficiently and, and clearly. So for me, the philosophy is ever evolving, and it changes all the time. And we talk about this pandemic year and how challenging it's been. But this is where people have really been put to the test. And, uh, you know, my philosophy was really boiled down to four, four topics, all because of a conversation I had. And I, you know, again, I stole it from another coach, a great coach, uh, Brad Flynn. He's Danny Flynn's son. Uh, he was mo most recently the assistant coach at the Red Rebels. And we were ha having a conversation in something that I really adopted. But I think as a coach behind the bench, you want your team to be able to own the dots. So own the dots, play inside. Uh, own the blue lines, both your defensive and offensive blue line, and own the paint. And for me, that's real simple. And then finally, you know, to encompass that, you want to own the puck. So four, four things of ownership there. And you ask yourself, and this kind of spills over from what Jeff was saying, you ask yourself, well, how do you build that out? And a lot of people want to build the goal line out, right? You think defense first, and that's how you start to encompass those four pillars. Um, and for me, most recently, especially during my job, uh, with Brampton and then even seeing it at the women's level, the best way to get your best players to buy in. And that's how you get your philosophy to get rolling. It was just, it, it's almost psychological. It's just a small adjustment to how I presented my philosophy to my team. So I started talking about 200 foot offense. And I know Dave King recently had a couple articles. He read a book, he wrote a book about uh, back checking to attack. So it's the same philosophy there. And when you build your systems from your offense it's just amazing how just the slight turn of, of, of wording can get people to buy in so traditionally as a young coach I used to build my my systems from the goal line out I go you know breakouts d zone neutral zone entries ozone and then I'd finish with back checking and back checking would become very cliche for me as something that 
that involved grit and hard work. But then I just kind of flipped it when I started, you know, hearing, you know, owning the blue lines, owning the inside the dots, owning the paint, owning the puck, and here and flipping into 200 foot offense. I start with my tracking. We want to get the puck back, so we start from our ozone back, and then it it, it falls into everything else. And I think that's how I've developed my philosophy. I want to be a 200 foot offensive team, and in that you start to really get some defensive responsibility out of your players and you try to outnumber players, uh, your opponents uh, across the ice. So from a, from a coaching perspective, that's how I would describe my philosophy and that's how it's kind of developed throughout my career. Very interesting. And, and Roy, have you seen um, worth working with the Tri-City or even when you're, you're working uh, your time with the Maple Leafs, have you seen the type of player um, that you're scouting emphasized in different skill or uh, one skill that you were you were seeing a lot of or, or being asked to, to identify a lot of uh, where it's not as much or, or vice versa? Well, I, I think if you go back to Toronto and everybody remembers Brian Burke's famous uh, looking for truculence. So, uh, I mean, that used to be a buzzword when I was working for the Maple Leafs. And um, personally, my philosophy hasn't changed. What I look for in a player, I, I think we've touched on two things already. Jeff's touched on identity and I think that's so important is um, working for a team an organization a general manager or you know in the case where I was the general manager identify and create the vision this is our identity this is what we're going to look like this is how we play and stay true to that personally I've always used the philosophy I believe coaching should and you complete the sentence and I believe coaching and complete the sentence and I've taken it to the next step of scouting. So for me, I believe scouting should identify uh, players and reward them for effort, character, ability, um, you know, and that's what it should do. You should expose those players to uh, elite programs and higher programs, tougher competition. So that's really what scouting should do. So my philosophy hasn't changed over the years um, in the sense I guess the biggest thing is working for an organization that knows what its identity is. I was fortunate when I started in major junior, I worked for Terry Simpson in the, with the Prince Albert Raiders. And uh, he was very clear the type of player he wanted. And the player didn't have to be perfect because that's what coaching does. It improves the player, but this is the style we're going to play. This is tech or, you know, technically what you have to be able to do. So those things are important with Toronto, yeah, the game changes, and the biggest thing with the players nowadays is their ability to process. Uh, players are so good now, defensemen are so good, gaps are tighter, so you have to be able to think two, three steps ahead, anticipate what's going to happen, anticipate scenarios. If we lose the puck, this is what's going to happen. If we gain the puck, this is where it's moving to. Playing away from the puck is important, and we've really cut the ice from uh, when people talk about the 200 foot game, we've really cut it into quarters. Now there's so much pressure. You have to be able to think quickly and move the puck quickly. So puck support play away from the puck is very important. When I'm watching players now, whether it be in a management role, evaluation role, scouting role, it's their ability to process quickly. And do they make other players better? The real good players understand the game. They're thinking ahead. Players without the puck are thinking ahead. They're given, you know, giving the puck handler uh, opportunities and outlets. And uh, that's really, I, I think, what's missing in today's game. The kids are well-versed in individual skills, but uh, they may be lacking, I think, a little bit in team play and overall play and using their teammates. So uh, if you can find some of those gyms that, uh, number one, have a high elite skill set and mix that in with the ability to think the game very quickly, uh, you've got a real good player there. I thought you were going to suggest uh, send him to, to, to Tri City if we find him there, Roy. But <laughs> <laughs> if, if you know anybody, we'll, we'll send them your way. <laughs> you, you know what? Your your league's only as good as your uh, weakest team. So I, I just think good players give them opportunity. If it's with us, that's great. If it's with another organization, that's great. And that's what makes competition fun. Uh, we just don't want to load up with the best players and. Uh, play you know 21 week teams we want to play good teams every night so uh, I have always looked at big picture 
the the player himself uh, has changed quite a bit in, in personality and skill set and uh, and ability um, as you know over the last uh, even 10 15 years uh, beyond then uh, much more even as well Spiros what are some of the things when you have your your coaches uh, in the room or when you're in the room with the players what are some of the things that for you are still non-negotiables that that players today or players 10 years ago or players 10 years from now uh, will have to possess to be successful on a team like yours yeah no that's a great question but for me uh, you know it's it's, it really kind of, again, spills over to, you know, what Roy and Jeff have been talking about, but it's, you have to identify your, your identity as a team. And once you do, there's, you know, the standards that your team has to meet uh, to be part of that, you know, that fraternity. So for me, like the work ethic is, is non-negotiable. We have a standard of when you get to the rink, it's on, like we're working. Uh, and not, that doesn't necessarily just mean on, on the ice. It means within our video sessions, within our, our recovery within our team workouts like that's there's no passes uh you know for laziness or for a lack of of effort so that's obviously non-negotiable the other thing is uh we never hinder anyone else's development we are in it together we're developing as a unit we're developing uh as a team and we have our team goals within that there is individual development we're trying to make each player better every day and they require a unique set of coaching i you know the whole there's no I in team. Uh, while it still rings true in a lot of senses, uh, today you are coaching, you know, for any given uh, week from 20 to 25, 20 individuals. So you have to keep that in mind as a coaching staff, but it can never be at the cost of someone else's development. So, you know, we don't want players ever um, feeling that they're, you know, they're above anybody else. That's, that's non-negotiable. Um, the other non-negotiables are, are the, you know, the ones that have been with us forever and not just in hockey with our jobs, with school, you just got to show up on time. You can never be late. And I think something as simple as that late for practice, late for a meeting, late for the bus, uh, you know, my, my kindergarten age children, I, they're never late for school. Uh, that is a complete non-negotiable. That one will probably, you know, outlast the test of time, I think. Uh, so that those are, are some of the, the examples I have. And they're simple things. They're not, it's not rocket science. They're just simple things of working together, being on time and knowing that we all have a common goal. And that's part of the culture of the room and, and the culture you set as, as a coach. And I'm interested from the general manager's chair, uh, and Jeff, I'll direct this question toward you. How do you create that culture? It may be when you're first coming into a program or, or how do you develop that culture over such an extended period of time like you did with Peterborough? Well, I think, again, you have to know what's important to you. And, and you can, I, I guess sometimes you can tweak it a little bit, but like Spiro said, there's certain things. I mean, it's work ethic um, and you have to be on it day to day, but, but you have to understand yourself what's important. So, um, you know, I went to Oshawa, for instance, and when I started there, they had a reputation, you know, as kind of a selfish team. They, you know, the, 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 their discipline on the ice wasn't very good. And, and uh, I got very fortunate because we had a, um, uh, we established a fitness test there, which they hadn't been doing. And, uh, you know, I said, we're going to do it Friday morning at 730. And uh, I said to the team, you know, make sure that nobody's late. Like, and this was my first kind of move as a general manager. And uh, so naturally, I'm sitting there the night before thinking somebody's probably going to be late. If it's Scott Lawton or Boone Jenner, I'm going to have to deal with it one way. <laughs> But if it's somebody else, I can deal with it a different way. So um, fortunately or unfortunately, we had, we had an overage player that was kind of on the bubble show up late and, uh, you know, really looked at it as a joke. And uh, so before we even started, you know, the training, I just brought him in and cut him. <laughs> you know, I just said, you're done. You're cut. That catches your team's attention pretty quickly. Um, they knew then that, you know, what, what, you know, what we expected was non-negotiable and that you don't always get uh, fortunate like that to have things kind of fall into your lap. And obviously, like I said, the higher end players, you might have had to deal with it differently. But I had an ability to, to send a message, a very strong message early, and uh, it permeated the team. And the culture, you know, I, I learned very quickly in Peterborough, 
over the years the importance of leadership. And when I was in Oshawa, I felt that they had some kids that were had leadership potential, but maybe didn't know it. And uh, so there was a lot of conversations that I had with guys, trying to make them understand that, you know, they have it in them. Because we had a player like Josh Brown, for instance, plays for the for the Ottawa Senators, and you know he was a very quiet guy, but he did everything right. And uh, I could sense from him he was getting frustrated. There was kids being late or coming into meetings a little bit late, and I was kind of stood back and. So I called him in one time and I said, you know, based on my experience of winning, um, we have no chance of winning. If you're going to look to me or the coach every time somebody does something wrong, <laughs> like, you know, it's got to come from within. And from that point on, he kind of looked at me and, and, and the light went on and he started to really rule the room. And so, you know, it's communication with your players. It's, it's like some of them have never won before either. And they're, they're trying to figure it out. They know sometimes what they'd like to do, but sometimes they just need a little push or they need somebody to, to believe in them that they have that leadership. So it's communication. It's setting a standard as, as Spiro said, I mean, work ethic, you know, attention to detail. Um, and I, I think the one thing first and foremost, that's non-negotiable is character. And, uh, you know, we were in Arizona or Oshawa or Peterborough. It's, it's, we do not want bad kids. And, you know, again, you know, you have to be very careful because what defines bad, you know, or, you know, somebody likes to, you know, they live a little bit hard away from the rink. So maybe you got to give them some guidance, but they want to win, you know, or there's other kids that are bad for different reasons. So trying to find good people, um, you know, how our players conducted themselves, how they treated other people, how they treated their teammates. That was non-negotiable. So character is really important. Establishing the culture. Um, sometimes, as I said, you get dressed. You, you have the ability to send a message real, real quick, and and we did that. But it's every day. You can't let it slip. You have to know again what's important to you. What are you trying to establish? And it's a day to day, and it's it's hard. Like there's some days you're like, man, I just don't want to deal with this. But you have to. You know, players watch everything. They. They see everything that goes on. They watch, they, they, they wait to see what the reaction is going to be. And as I've often said, you never fool players. And, and I think players have to understand very clearly who's in charge and uh, what the expectations are. And, and generally, not to ramble on here, but I believe that, that players want structure. They don't want you know, just a free reign, go do what you wanna do, show up late, no big deal. They know in their heart, they want structure. And so when you're establishing it, when you're on it on a daily basis, that forms your culture. And generally, players that have any, any uh, thought at all about winning will buy in. And if they don't, then they're not long for your team. So long-winded answer, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's part, of, part of over the years, what, something that I became very passionate about is culture and building it and developing it and, and how you do it. But it, it's crucial. And some teams, let's be honest, some teams never get it. Some teams have no hope of winning. They've never won. They never will because they don't understand that part of it. And it's not, certainly not rocket science. Uh, again, we've got a, a general manager, a head coach, uh, an assistant GM and head scout uh, in this uh, management roundtable here for the, the Hockey Minds Conference and, and excited to, uh, to pick their brains as we go along here. Uh, Roy, I'm interested, uh, you know, I'm trying to stay away from reflecting on the past and being a little more positive over what hockey uh, had to go through over the last uh, year or so. But uh, in your type of position, I'm sure if you hadn't been using it already, uh, video was something that has become, you know, first and foremost amongst finding some of these players and, and seeing some of these guys, especially in a, a head scouting type role. Do you see that now as an advantage or, or where do you think the front office or the coaching side of things, uh, um, Spiro's mentioning it's a, a copycat sport, where do you see the next advantage uh, coming from without giving away all your secrets, of course? <laughs> well, I, I think the advantage goes back to Spiro's and Jeff talking about uh, culture and, and, and definitions and uh, first of all defining culture like a lot of people use the buzzwords but they never win because they don't understand they say yeah we have a good culture here well what does that mean so for me culture is to an organization what character is to an individual so that's the first thing so when you talked about the non-negotiables yeah that's part of your organization what's non-negotiable here um the video scouting is great you can slow it down you can isolate uh, you can look for the player's individual skill. 
for me, it'll never replace the in-person viewing though, because the intangibles that I look for when I go out scouting, I mean, it, we can all tell who can skate very well, who handles the puck at high speed, who passes well, who shoots to score. Those things you can see and everybody can see that. Uh, the thing, the intangibles is what separates a good player from a great player for me. And for me, I'm, I'm watching the bench when the player's going back. Is he going back hard? When he gets to the bench, the coach has a comment for him. Is he engaged or is he just nodding his head or just looking away? How does he interact with his teammates and his line mates when they get back to the bench? Are they energized? Are they talking about something that just happened or what they might be doing? So, you know, the video is great. Um, I think it lets us get specific. For, for me, it's, it's a great teaching tool for our scouts. So, I mean, I look, go through a lot of reports and I see them giving threes and fours for skating and I'm going, uh, that's maybe a two, two, five, maybe a three. And here's why. So I can break it down and, uh, and I have, so, you know, we're looking for fours and fives in skating. This is what we're looking for in terms of edge control, uh, acceleration, gate, you know, um, all, all those things. So the video is good there. Um, but I don't think it'll ever replace in person, um, scouting and, you know, I'm an older guy, but I'm not an old curmudgeon, but I, I have a lot of respect for someone like Lou Lamarillo who, who gets it. He's an older guy. But it's funny that, you know, the culture in his organizations, uh, winning just seems to follow. So that just doesn't happen per chance. Those are things and treats that he brings to his organization and follows through on. And, you know, I know video, obviously a big part of it. Analytics, that's the big buzzword as well. That's a big part of the game now. But uh, it's funny, I asked Kyle Dubas when he started with Toronto, how we could use analytics to uh, advance ourselves in scouting and uh, the reply I got was, well, it doesn't really apply to scouting. It's more uh, how a team plays. And that was a real disappointment for me because, uh, you know, you're always looking for something new. What's the, uh, you know, to turn the page to get better. And uh, uh, wasn't very, I wasn't very enthusiastic about that answer. And I was quite disappointed. So, so like I say, the video is part of it. Um, you never, we have to understand society has changed. There's a lot more single parent families. So kids come from different uh, groups where they're competing within the family and their siblings. A lot of times now it's one, one child, maybe two, but it might be a single parent. Uh, so the dynamics are a lot different than they were 15, 20, 25 years ago. So you have to be aware of what's happening in society and apply that to your sport. Spiros, do you see a lot of uh, more analytics at that level? Um, is that something that you've followed along being a, a young coach that, you know, it's been around for a good chunk of, of your career. Do you see that as an advantage at this point or, or where are you trying to pull from? Uh, well, it, you know, it depends on what's available to you too. So in the last seven years of my career, I, I've been working in the CIS and, and the ECHL. So we don't have exactly what's available at the American League and NHL levels, but it is something that can really give you in certain criteria. I, I like to think of it as a tool. Uh, I, I wouldn't put all my eggs in that basket, but it is something that is beneficial and advantageous uh, and then bringing it right to Roy's comment about today's society. Our players today, are everything they do in their lives is instant. They want to get the news, it's instant. They want to hear what's happening with their favorite athlete, it's instant. So what Video and the analytics allows us to do as coaches, as we're trying to keep up with the curve, is to give them instant feedback. Uh, and I think that it's a really great tool, aside from uh, it giving us a snapshot of, of different criteria that we want to look at, aside from that, it gives us the ability to offer that instant analysis to the players and keep them engaged and keep them locked in and direct their focus to certain um you know, certain aspects of the game that we need them to continue to get better at so they can develop and also help us get to our team. Uh, so it definitely is something that continue to, to grow, but I think it's evolving. It seems like it used to be you're either all analytics or you're not, not just in hockey, but in sports. And now it's trying to, now it's kind of evolving into how is it mixed into some of our traditional methods, into some of our new wave methods, and how is it all encompassing as a coach when you're trying to uh, give your players a buffet of options of how they can develop and be better. Um, in terms of some things coming out of this, this year, because that's kind of how the question started, it's something that's long existed, but it really has come to the forefront for us because we haven't had any other option. But this right here, for me as a coach, 
this is going to become a critical advantage. And again, it already existed, but we just never, it wasn't at the front of our minds. So for me in the ECHL, there'd be times in a period of two weeks, we'd have three practices. We'd play in five different cities. We'd be playing seven to, to nine to 10 games. And I, you know, I get the guys in at, at 9 a.m. We practice at 10. The majority of them want to be out of there by 1 p.m. And I got a couple individual video sessions that I want to hit on five guys. And I'm telling Johnny and Billy, hey, I'm going to get Tom and Tim first. You got to wait around, hang out in the lounge. And I'll be honest, this is, it's, it's a flaw. But there were times where I was like, hey, I'll get you tomorrow. And I'll get you the next day. And then by the time our next game rolled around, I still hadn't hit on those guys on their individual sessions. Now I'm doing them a disservice. I'm doing me a disservice. And all this time, now it's obviously become uh, you know, relevant in today's day. But I had this Zoom thing, right? So now it's going to make my day easier. It's going to make the player's day easier. It allows them to reset. And I can go to John and say, hey, I'm going to do a couple, you know, in-person sessions with these two players. Go home, get your nap in, get your lunch in, hang out with your girl or your play, play your Fortnite, whatever. And at 5 p.m. tonight, we're going to jump on for a quick 15-minute Zoom session. We can go over your clips. And I think that is something that a lot of coaches uh, have realized through this pandemic those that were staying in touch with their players and keeping the development going is going to alleviate a lot of pressure off of us and maybe even keep the guys more bought in uh, because they can spread out their day. So uh, something I think that will really help in the future. Really interesting points uh, throughout this. And, and Jeff, we'll, we'll uh, get your, your opinion on this as well, as far as the analytics side of things and the numbers. And, and you know, this is something that I'm sure you've seen evolve throughout your career. And, and there would have been a good portion of time that, uh, you know, maybe time on ice and plus minus were the analytics where, you know, now you've got everything else. But, you know, to Roy's point and, and to Spiros's as well, as much as we're now number hungry and, uh, and want to see everything right away, like Spiros said, uh, we really still are going back to the the people and the individual side of things uh, as well uh, Jeff uh, just your your thoughts on that well <clears throat> I, I think like like Roy and Spiros I you know I've been around it a long time and you're right Matt like I, there was a day where in Peterborough we were unique because we we took time on ice you know nobody else did it we had two kids that used to travel with us and they did all the time on ice I mean it's as basic as it sounds teams weren't doing it um, plus minus, you know, we, we were big on that. Roger Nielsen kind of started that. And obviously we were big on that. So, you know, when I got to the NHL, initially analytics weren't really a part of it when I started, but obviously near the end, they became a very significant part of it. And uh, I, I was frustrated a little bit like Roy in Arizona because they kept a lot of that stuff in house and, and, and very, um, you know, very secretive with it, even within the organization. So I used to sit in meetings, I'd say like, well, I don't know our analytic, like, tell, tell me about it, <laughs> you know, like, I want to learn. And I, I could never really get a handle on what they felt was important, and uh, which was a flaw in the organization, because it wasn't a consistent way to, to do business. So when I left the Coyotes, I said, you know, I'm going to dig into this, and I'm going to try and learn more about it. And I, uh, I read a lot of books. I'm far from an expert, but I have a little more knowledge than I used to have. But one of the things that that stood out, and I went and met met with some people that were higher end analytics um, experts, and I asked a lot of questions. But the one thing that stood out to me that I, I, I truly believe is that the teams that are successful with analytics that use it properly and and successfully are the ones that take a collaborative approach. In that you know, the eye, the eye test is important. The analytics are important. Let's talk about this as a group and come to a conclusion. Let's not step back as analytics people and say the eye people are, are ancient, you know, <laughs> because as Roy said, there's a lot of value in watching players and how the camera doesn't catch everything. There's a lot of value in analytics because it forces you to think and, uh, you know, to think that they come back with some things that, you know, you might want to go back and watch your player and say, no, I'm still strong on my thoughts on them. Um, or you go back and say, I hadn't really thought about this analytically, but you're right. You know, so, so analytics is not going anywhere. It, it's very important. And, and I think it's very um, beneficial, but it, the only way it works properly is collaboratively in, in my point, uh, my, my vision, but, and you can never replace the the in-person uh, uh, eye test. Because just to give an example, we talk about wanting good people. And I remember years ago, I was at a, at a game in Toronto and 
I don't go to games with, you know, Pete's or anything on my jacket. I just watch games and uh, player got kicked out of the game that we had a lot of regard for. And uh, he went and got dressed, came back and stood beside me with his father. And the language that came out of those guys, I was <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Like very, very clearly identified himself as, as, a, as a kid that we didn't want a part of, you know? So you're not gonna see that in, vis- in video. Be- being around, talking to people, that's not gonna go away, but, but either our analytics, and, and again, I, I'm a firm believer in analytics when used properly, and I think a lot of people that, that, are, that are really strong on the analytics and like, you know, a lot of these people coming through, they've never won. So they don't understand some of the things that are valuable, that are necessary, that may not translate analytically, but are crucial to your team. So I think you have to be open-minded and you have to be willing to collaborate respectfully between the two ways of evaluating players. So it's a little bit of a pontification on, on analytics there, but, but that's that's my thoughts on it anyways but it when you when you do the two together as i'm sure they do in long island with a guy like lou lamorello that is clearly in charge establishes the culture puts brings the two groups together with the understanding that it's done as a group for the team who is the best player here let's do what's best for the team not what's best for the individual so anyways i that, that's how i think the two of them have to work together to be successful I want to get into some some individual uh, questions uh, for for you guys and, and Spiros, you had kind of led into this, so we'll we'll start with you. Um, and and as far as the reflection of uh, not having time or pushing off um, doing video with some of the players or or things like that. You know, all of you obviously have had uh, successful careers. It, it seems as though all of you are still looking to continue those careers and, and trying to get better. So how do you self evaluate at the positions that you're in right now? What are you looking at in terms Internally, um, for your for yourself, uh, to in ways to improve, and and how do you do that? How do you you know look in the mirror and reflect? Like you said, Spiros, I did not do this very well, or this was not something that I was very good at. Now it's a point of emphasis, and now it's something that uh, becomes a strength. Yeah, well, the first step for me uh, coming out of a a normal uh, season would be to really have a deliberate process for your exit meetings. You know, and this is something that it took me some time to learn young coach where my exit meetings used to be kind of just a, a final goodbye and just like hey you know just very on the surface to me kind of digging a little bit deeper and I'm not digging deeper more so to find out more about the player it's actually to find more about the job I did and my staff and where we can be better so I think that's step number one challenge your player to come in make them feel comfortable enough obviously throughout the entirety of the season where they can feel that they're being heard, they're empowered, and they have a voice. And when you build that relationship, when they come in on their exit meetings, you can really start to learn a lot about yourself. So, you know, different methods from uh, you know, surveys, questionnaires, or specific questions for those individual players. You know, I sit down with my staff. We got coming in today. What are the questions we got to hit on with him? Anything that stood out from the season? Any, uh, you know, game-changing moments, positive and negative that we need to touch on, we can learn can be better so that's step number one step number two, obviously there's there's a a holistic approach where you kind of evaluate yourself as a person some of the things that you wish you, you could have done better uh you know through the year i always take notes and, you know I, i'll give you one exa- i'll give you one example uh we had a really big goaltending prospect in brampton joey decord uh the ottawa senators and he you know he got his nhl uh opportunity this year and obviously he got hurt but he was a guy that I was getting a lot of direction from the senators, when to play back to backs, when to, uh, you know, sit him out, when to just really test his character, kind of encompassing everything we're talking about here today. And um, I got some direction. They wanted to see him play a back to back on the weekend, but on Friday we were playing in Worcester, Massachusetts. He's from the Boston area. It just kind of went right over my head. I didn't, you know, I didn't play him that night. I sensed his disappointment. I challenged him of why he was disappointed. And I, the whole time, it's just like I was completely oblivious to the fact that it was his only opportunity that year to play in Massachusetts. And so, you know, I just, I just made a note of it. I'm not saying I was wrong or right. I was trying to, you know, appease the Ottawa Senators. I was trying to put him in a situation where he can prove to management that he was going to take, you know, on a, a back-to-back responsibility. But I kind of I just my timing of it wasn't right. I think I should have played him in Massachusetts 
uh, just to give him an opportunity to play in front of his family at the pro level. So that's just something I took a note of, right? And then I revisit that in the off season. Like how could I approach that better? How, you know, the, the research I got to do into my players a little bit, how they're feeling, where their mental state is, check in with them a little bit more often. Uh, more concise point of view, like my systems, what worked, what didn't. Uh, you know, taking a real audit on your penalty kill, your power play, some face-off plays that you ran, uh, where the major turnovers were and what did they come off of. Uh, so just constant research. And then aside from you as an individual as a coach, who do, I, you know, who do I look up to as a coach? Is you know, is it John Cooper? Is it Gerard Gallant? I got to take this opportunity now to take a deep dive into their systems, see what's been successful for them, and, and take on some research projects. You know, how many goals do they get off their exits? Uh, what do they do on their exits? And that's just constantly staying sharp. So there's there's a lot, of, there's, a, there's it's a multi-pronged approach to how to become a better coach uh, from a philosophical to a, a structure and system approach. But you, it's all about just doing the work. You talk about non-negotiables, those are, those are self non-negotiables. I can sit back and, have a, you know, a few cervezas and sit by a beach or a pool, which I'm going to do at some point too. That's important too, but you got to get right back to work. Your work that you put in in May, June, July, that's what gets you better. So, uh, you know, there's no one clear answer on how I get better, but it's, it's just putting in that time. Roy, do you do a lot of uh, self-reflecting? Maybe uh, from a, a scouting point of view, it, it might be a little bit different in the sense that you draft a, a player three, four years ago, and you don't really know how that turns out until you know the player actually develops into either what you're expecting or not what you're expecting one way or the other. Do you do a, an evaluation like that, or, or how do you look to, uh, to improve your craft every year? Well, I have the benefit of time on, on my side, and time and experience and you know the only two things that are going to change your life are the people you meet and the books you read so I've had a lot of time to do both and um, you know and I always tell our scouts you know people refer to the draft as a crapshoot and I go why would you devalue what we do so it's not a crapshoot uh, when you're dealing with human nature sometimes things don't work out because we can't be 100% uh, predictors of human nature so when I look back um, my, my disappointments come from some of the stupid things I used to do when I coached minor hockey, um, you know, fired up and talking to the other bench or the other bench talking to me and I'm getting distracted. And then you realize as you get older, you stop beating yourself up and you go, that's experience. And those are lessons you learn along the way. And if you recognize it now, you've learned them. So those things are good. Um, what I like to do now is share, as I said, at the top of this program, it's giving back now and, uh, you know, I'm quite comfortable where I am. I've been a general manager in the Western Hockey League. Uh, I've been assistant GM. I am an assistant GM now. I've scouted in the NHL. So I've done a lot of things in hockey that I would have never thought that I could have done, uh, you know, 30 years ago. And I, I've done it. And we've been successful. Where I've been, our programs have been successful. I believe I've played a part in that. So that's important to me. Uh, you know, I, I take pride in my work and preparation. So um, looking back at myself, it's what do I have to share now? And, um, you know, sometimes there's a battle because you think, well, it's old against young. And that's not really the case. I don't think human instinct changes. I think young people want to learn. I think they want opportunity. Going back to Spiro's earlier point, I think young people want things a lot quicker than, uh, you know, somebody like perhaps Jeff and, you know, myself. We took the time. Uh, we had great mentors along the way. We learned lessons along the way, uh, really respected our elders. Um, but there's still a lot of young people like that as well, willing to learn and want to learn and want to be good at their craft. Uh, where I am now, I'm very comfortable. We're, you know, in, in sports, in the hockey business in particular, you know, you're always, when you're doing it full time, I tell people there's no safety net. So you can be fired. Uh, ownership can change. You could be let go for no specific reason other than the fact that somebody has a friend who's a friend that wants to coach the team or wants to manage the team. So sometimes it makes no sense. It's not like a, uh, a typical career. So if you can't roll with those punches, you really, you shouldn't be in it, number one. And uh, so I take pride in my work. I'm satisfied with my work. I'm always learning. That's the fun part of the game is learning new things, changing. And, uh, you know, now I'm, I'm at the backside where I want to share what I know, uh, be a mentor to others. And at the same time, uh, like Jeff, 
you know, I have a grandchild now that, uh, you know, I want to spend some time. I always laugh at people when they're 60 and they say they want to spend time with their families while well, your kids are 40. I don't know if they really want to hang out with you, you know, so uh, I, I don't buy that argument. But at the same time, our kids are pretty good, pretty good people. We have a, we have a doctor in the family. We have a police officer in the family. So we take pride in that. And I've always said that I will treat players as I wanted our children to be treated. So, you know, with dignity, with respect, we'll teach. And the big thing is communicating. And uh, you have to change. You have to stay on top of those things because the language changes. Uh, you know, you can't use Guy Lafleur as an example anymore because kids don't know who Guy Lafleur is. Some don't know who Bobby Orr is. So you have to stay modern. You have to stay with it. Who, you know, who are the key players that they can relate to? And you have to use the language that they use as well. So that's the fun part. That's the part that uh, keeps me enthusiastic. Jeff, with two uh, young grandkids, uh, I have two young kids myself. I, I'm looking forward to going back into the rink to relax. And I'm sure <laughs> you would be uh, the same as, as well as anybody as Spiros as well uh, uh, that, uh, that likes that, that break. But, you know, you mentioned Arizona. You'd mentioned the, the analytics portion of things. And, and then you took it upon yourself to, to do some digging and try to find out a little bit more about analytics and how that worked. For yourself uh, on uh, self-evaluation, uh, how you, you did that and, and how you've seen yourself uh, progress through some of those things yeah I think well you know like Ryan Spiros will said I, I, I'm the same I mean you have to reflect I think sometimes people say you know don't look back you always have to look forward well I think in this business you have to look back you know and I think back to you know times when I was coaching in the OHL you know how I did things and how I could have done things better um, management you know how I, I I look back now and I said geez if I knew then what I know now you know I could have been I could have done a better job but I, I still have a passion for this. And, and I think that like, it's very important in this business to find people that I always say, do it for the right reasons, that they have a passion for it, that it's not about putting a jacket on or, you know, being able to hang out and say you work for, you know, whoever it is. It's, it's, it's just, it's having that passion. And if you have that passion, then you're always analyzing yourself. And one of the great tools we have uh, in this business is, is RinkNet. And as you know, when you're scouting and evaluating players, RinkNet doesn't lie. <laughs> I mean, the, your stuff's in there. I got stuff in there from 10, 15 years ago. And you look back and you're like, man, like I was wrong on that player or how I articulated it. That wasn't very good. I've got to be better, you know? So, and, and, and I, and I talked to a lot of people too. And, and uh, I think it's real easy to talk about players you were right on. I think sometimes it's a little bit painful to go back and say like, I was wrong on that guy. And I, you know, I'll give you an example, like Ryan Suzuki for Montreal. I, I liked him as a player, but you know, he, he's way far exceeded what I thought he would do. So I went back on my, my reports and I'm like, man, I gotta be better. Like I can't, that guy's too good of a player to, to not be right on. And, and, and why was it? And again, I, I had him as a first round pick, but not, where he should have been probably, especially given that I'm from Ontario. So, so RinkNet is a great tool to really go back and analyze and, and to try and get better and to understand who you were wrong about and, and try and figure out maybe why you were wrong. We can all, as I said, gloat about who we were right about. Um, but I think as I get older too, I become much more passionate now about trying to continue to learn and, and be open-minded on a lot of different things. So I'm much more open-minded now. I, I, I try and read a lot about soccer, for instance, and, you know, teams like Barcelona, Real Madrid, how they build a culture. So I'm still trying to learn and, and you know, self-evaluating yourself is crucial. And, and, and I look at it now and I'm like, I, I'm probably not going to be a general manager again in the OHL because I'm not sure there's ever going to be a fit for me anyways. But I like, I could do a lot better job now because than I did before because I've been much more self-reflective and I've tried to get better. I don't, even after you have success, you know, like you, you win an OHL championship, it's still crucial. Yes, you won a championship, but you didn't win the Memorial Cup. So why didn't you, you know? And, and you know, I'm sure like everybody on this thing, I watch the NHL. I watch, you know, how people conduct themselves. You know, I, I'm not afraid to reach out to people and ask questions too. I mean, I've got a couple of guys that played for me uh, that are coaches in the NHL now. And I, I'm not afraid to reach out to them and say like, you know, 
what's this guy like for you? Because when I watched him, I thought this, is this still, am I still right? Or, you know, as a coach in the NHL now, like what, what, and, and I actually had one, one of the guys that played for me, that's a head coach. He just, he said, you know, it's hard now to, to, to talk these kids language, you know, and understand, and your assistant coach is so crucial to bridge it. So, so those are all things when you talk, you communicate, you learn, um, and, and self-reflection, I think, if you're passionate about what you do, you want to get better, you want to be open-minded. And I think, again, because of, you know, wanting to self-reflect and get better, I'm much more open-minded now. Um, experience, I think, has made me better. I've still got a long ways to go. There's, there's a lot out there, but, but just it's being open-minded and, and being willing to admit when you were wrong, but then try and figure out, like, why was I? And how can I try not to make that same mistake again? But you also have to give yourself the ability to make mistakes because, you know, I, I, it's funny because I, I, I listened to a podcast and I'll, I'll finish it off here, but there's a, the guy that's the team leader for Red Bull racing in F1. And uh, that's a lot of money, obviously that that's on the, on the line all the time, but this guy leads, he heads up the whole Red Bull F1 team. And, and I heard him speak and he's an amazing speaker. And, and one of the, the points he made was we allow our people to make mistakes. You can't be afraid. Like you can't be afraid to make mistakes, but when you make them, be self-reflective and learn from them. That's how you get better. Don't, uh, and, and if you're going to be afraid to make them, you shouldn't be in the business. <laughs> you know, you've got to have some courage. You've got to understand what your philosophies are, what you believe in, and you've got to be ready to make decisions. And if you sit on the fence your whole career, I, you know, that's not the type of people we want. So um, being open-minded and self-reflective, analyzing your mistakes, your successes is crucial and ongoing. Last couple questions here for uh, Jeff uh, Spiros and, and Roy. Again, thank you so much for your time and uh, and experience uh, and expertise uh, going through these topics. I know for the Hockey Minds podcast, one thing that a lot of people are, are looking for is that advice in, in moving their careers forward. I think we're in an is interesting position in this conversation with uh, a couple of uh, the members here of the panel that are looking to, uh, to get uh, into uh, another position or move up or whatever the situation may be. So uh, Spiros, at this point for yourself, how do you you pursue a job uh, after the experience that you've had uh, as a, a head coach, uh, as director of hockey operations, assistant coach at a number of different levels. Um, when you're looking for a job, what types of things are, are you doing to, to put yourself out there? Uh, well, you know, if, if you're waiting until you're looking for a job to start impressing people, you're probably a little too late. Obviously, our industry, you can't e.com, right? And uh, send a resume in. So uh, for me, it's Every, everything that I have the most traction on right now is because I built a relationship with someone and I've impressed upon them that, uh, you know, I, I have a good knowledge as a hockey coach. I have the ability to develop players. But most importantly, just like we talked about players earlier in the segment, is that, that I'm a good person, right? That I'm somebody that you can have a, a couple beers with and hang out with and, and, and be around when you're talking about development and, and systems. So, uh, you know, that's, you're always putting yourself out there uh, when you're working in our industry. And as long as you stay true to yourself and your values and who you are, you're going to hopefully make those connections that when jobs come open and people know you're looking or that you're in need of a job, as it comes out of the blue, you're not even looking for a job. And so you're a qualified candidate. That's how things start to come your way. But for young individuals out there, and I've made the mistakes and I've, I've done things right and I've, I've done it all. Um, you got to treat the job you're in as the most important job you're ever going to have. You know, that's the one where you need to succeed at. That's the one where you got to give your hundred percent care and, and your effort to, to those players. Like that's your family right now in that moment. And, you know, being over prepared and over successful is only going to help you um, moving on to the next level, because uh, I'll share a, just a quick piece of advice that one of my, my uh, good friends and, and most important mentors, Andy Murray, gave me is, you know, I, young in my career, I was working there when I was 26. I was always about the next thing, the next thing, and how I'm going to become a head coach. And he warned me about mountain sickness, and I had no clue what the heck he was talking about. And he, he made me read a book about climbing Mount Everest. And basically, you know, when you climb Mount Everest, it, it technically can be done in a day if all else was equal, and you can just get up to the top, it could. But the thing is, it, it, it's a process. You build different you got to start at base camp and you got to build different camps as, as you move up, as the uh, elevation changes, as the atmosphere around you changes, the air levels. Sometimes you got to spend a week at one spot 
And there's been times that people have been this close, you know, a hundred yards away and they can't make it to the top, uh, you know, for atmospheric reasons. And that's what mountain sickness is. And he equated that, uh, he used that analogy to a coaching career. If you try and, and go up too fast and you're not prepared, it'll kill you. And sometimes you only get one, one shot. And I've learned that the hard way. And, you know, I've also done it his way and his was way better. We're prepared, treat the job you have as, as the most important job as you're ever going to have and enjoy the journey. So that, that'd be uh, my advice. I, I know the other two guests have been in a lot longer than, than me. So I'm interested to hear what they have to say, but as a young coach um, going through it right now, be over-prepared and just enjoy it. Jeff, uh, obviously resume speaks for itself uh, in, in your experience at multiple different levels and, and multiple different positions. Uh, for yourself now looking to to stay involved in the game and, and maybe in a different position entirely than what you've experienced before, how do you go about doing that? Well, first of all, I think what Spiro said really resonates with me. And I think it's a strong message to young people that want to get into this business. Um, and I often said, I, I was very fortunate. I grew up around Roger Nielsen and Roger Nielsen was a coach that loved coaching, coached for the right reasons, um, got good at what he did and the next level found him. You know, Roger, as Spiro said, Roger didn't look around hoping I, my whole goal is to get to the NHL. It was like, no, my goal is to do a good job every day you know, and, and, and be passionate about what I do and care about people. So, you know, I, I, I think that that was a great, great story equating it to, to climbing Mount Everest. But in my case, like I, I've reached out to people and, uh, you know, I, I, for me right now, the most important thing is I want to be with good people because I've been with people that, in my opinion, weren't people I wanted to be with. So I've kind of been, I'm, I'm a little bit picky now, not that there's 10 teams lining up at my door either, but but I know what I want and I know, you know, who I want to be involved with. Um, hopefully something like that comes about. But I think going back to what Spiro said, I, I hope that my reputation, uh, you know, creates opportunities. I've got to be aggressive and get my name out there, but I hope my reputation, how I treated people, um, you know, how I conducted business myself, um, you know, kind of precedes me. But people don't always knock on your door. So I'm not afraid to send my resume out you know, and, and I've sent it out and I've talked to people, um, you know, sometimes people will get back to you and they'll say, well, we don't have anything. And, and uh, you know, you can still have conversations because it's a learning situation too. It's like, well, if you were me, what would you do? <laughs> you know, and people have given me some pretty good, pretty good feedback because, um, you, you know, I've been in a position to try and hire people and I've been in a position where I'm trying to, trying to be hired, but I also want to try and balance it because, Sometimes you can become a pain if you're harassing people all the time. P people don't want that. But I think you have to let people know you're interested. I think, you know, how you conduct yourself is important. Um, I think whenever you send anything out, attention to detail is important. Um, I've gotten letters in the past where my name spelled wrong or, you know, they don't even use my name. It's a, it's a form letter and they put somebody else's name there by mistake. So, so how you, how you approach it is, is crucial. And uh, so, Again, I apologize for a little, little bit long-winded, but, but I hope what I've done in the past um, precedes me a little bit. I hope how I've treated people helps me. Um, and I hope there's you know, a situation out there with good people that I can get excited again about, about becoming part of. So, um, but just to finish it, I'm not afraid to reach out and get my resume. I send it there. I send it to the East Coast League. I send it, you know, because people think you just want to scout. Well, no, I don't know what's out there. So I, I've sent it all over the place and it's it's a, it's funny sometimes who gets back to you so you got to be aggressive you can't be a pain in the ass and and as Spiro said be a good person and, and Roy in the the position that you've been in and, and have held for for a number of years you've seen people come and go in that that organization you've had the opportunity to to hire people and, and bring people on board at this point in, in your career what are you looking for if there was an opening at Tri-City what type of person are you looking for and, and what are some of those skills that uh, you would think projective or, or pro possible um, uh, applicants should possess if, if uh, they're looking to be the right fit well, I always tell young, uh, young potential scouts, and it could be male or female, um, I'm open to anything. The, the biggest thing, though, is to have your personal life in order. Like so many people want to do it. Uh, I guess it seems glamorous to somebody on the outside, but it's time consuming. Uh, you need the support of your family. There's no doubt about it. If you have young children, that's a consideration. 
And that's something that should be discussed with your family. And uh, so if you have the support at home, if you have the support of a full-time job where you can take the time away and, and do some scouting, all those things are important. Um, you know, I, I tell young people that uh, it's for an entry level, it's, it's not a job where you're going to make a living out of it. Uh, that's not going to happen at the major junior level. So it's in essence, it's a volunteer job. It's an extension of coaching minor hockey. Um, yeah, there's some pay involved. The other thing I, you know, like so often I'll get a resume and it says, I'm not looking for any compensation. I just want to get my foot in the door. And I always say, don't, don't even bring that up because if there's compensation with the position, the team will let you know what it is. And then you can decide for you to say, I'll do it for free. Uh, my experience tells me that never works out because it might start that way, but then all of a sudden, well, you know what? I'm a little bitter here because I'm doing this for free. So I'm going to put in a $200 bill for gas because, you know, I got to get paid something. So don't bring compensation into it. Leave that out of your resume. As I say, the team will tell you how that works and then you can decide from that. The other thing is, um, you know, I think both uh, Spiros and Jeff touched on it is the networking as well get involved with summer hockey programs, whether it's the provincial, uh, you know, or the Hockey Canada programs, the uh, U16, U18, U17s, get involved with those and you really network. I mean, some high-level coaches come through, uh, some high-level uh, executives come through. You get your face out there, you get your name out there. So when Spiro says he's a good person, well, somebody sitting in that coach's room is going to pick that out. And it might be two years down the road, might be three years down the road, and they're going geez, that guy, he really impressed me. I wonder what he's doing now. And they'll look you up because so often you're going to be approached more so than um, putting in your resume and somebody's going to hire you. So for a young person, be involved. Are you somebody that I see in the rink, you know, and somebody that I'd like, somebody that, yeah, I could sit down, you mature, um, you know, you're not a loud mouth, you're not in a sewing circle, you're doing your work. So all those things are important. And then from a coaching standpoint, hiring coaches uh, goes back to our video com conversation. I'm watching benches as well. I'm looking at bench management. I'm looking at teams development, uh, player development, interaction on the bench. And, uh, you know, whether people believe it or not, I'm always gauging coaches too. Who are the young coaches that we should be watching and who are the up and coming coaches and, you know, communication skills, teaching skills, all those things are important. So for young people, don't be intimidated. Get your resume out there. Stay away from the compensation end of it. Uh, going back to Jeff's point, you don't want to be a pain in the butt, but at this, and you don't want to be too needy, though, either. If you're needy, it's almost, I mean, liken it to a player on your team. Is this player going to be high maintenance? Am I going to have to do a lot of stroking and, you know, back padding and you're okay? And, you know, and, and the other thing that I, I refuse to do is the shadowing. I just, when our scouts go to the rink, uh, you know, they've got a task at hand and they're doing their task and I'm not big on uh, shadowing and then trying to teach while we're going. Um, we can do it in a video session. We can do, do it in a sit down conversation, but when work is work, it's not uh, bring your kid to work day. It's our guys got work to do. So I'm not big on shadowing and that might sound a little harsh, but that's, that's a philosophy I go with. So Matt, can I just, so there you have it. <laughs> I have yeah, to... Jeff. Just one piece to what Roy's saying. I think I agree wholeheartedly, but but I, I think the people that that really stand out when you're looking to get into the business are the people that have, have paid their dues. And too often, you know, people want to get into scouting, but they don't want to get in at the tier two or the junior B level. They want to get in right at the OHL or the Western. You know, it's like, well, why don't you learn the craft or coaching? You know, you know, I coach in the OHL. Well, if you want to be really good, work your way up you know, that experience counts. So sometimes that's a mistake people make too. They want to start right at the top. And uh, I think Spiros talked about it earlier too. You know, you, you've got to go through the experiences to, to really be good at what you do. So don't be afraid to start at a lower level. Learn, make your mistakes in junior B or junior C, be part of a team network and then grow from there. 
And and Spiros, the last word goes to you as uh, as an opportunity that uh, not to to make you nervous there, but uh, uh, again looking uh, for an opportunity uh, as far as qualities and and you've mentioned people in a number of times and I'm sure that that is going to be a heavy portion of the answer to this question. But uh, when you're looking at uh, a potential fit uh, as an employer, what types of general managers, ownership, uh, what type of, of front office staff are you looking to be involved with? Uh, you know, I just want to be involved with people that, uh, you know, that care, that, uh, you know, are care not only about the players and their development and what, you know, we can give to them to make sure that they have the best experience, whether it's at the, you know, university level, a student athlete experience or a pro level, uh, you know, a family experience. I just want people who care about me as well, that, you know, know that, that uh, I have my goals, my ambitions, know that I'm going to make mistakes, the ability to make the mistakes like Jeff pointed out earlier. I, I need to, I need to know that. So yeah, when you're looking for opportunities, you're also trying to get management ownership, um, you know, your, your point of contact or the person you report to are going to be like as well. And again, I've, I've made those same mistakes. You know, I, I've, I've taken a job because it looks so great and I didn't really evaluate who I'd be working for. Uh, and that usually doesn't end, end that well. Um, you just want to be able to have good, honest conversations. Uh, and you can tell people's intentions pretty quickly. And that's the same thing when I'm hiring an assistant. You know, next to my wife, the assistant coach that I work with is a person I spend the most time with in my life, more than my wife during the eight-month hockey season. Uh, so I just need to be able to get along. You know, I, I need to be able to, you know, be in close quarters with them. I need to be able to have hard conversations with them. So, uh, you know, I, I look for it both up and down in the organization. And when you are comfortable and you can be yourself, that's usually you're going to be in a good situation, uh, you know, where you can continue learning and continue developing your players and yourself. Right. Well, uh, gentlemen, I, I appreciate all of your time. I, I know I've gone over the hour and I, I warned Ryan of that uh, when you let uh, an old media guy talk, like uh, we had said at the beginning, uh, an hour was going to be tough. I could have told him at the beginning. I think I still got another page of notes here. We could have gone through for, for part two, but I uh, appreciate all of you guys taking the time for this. And and again, congratulations to uh, to Ryan for uh, getting this conference uh, off the ground and all the success that that he's had and, and with the, uh, the Hockey Minds podcast. So again, if you do want to go back at uh, Jeff Tui, uh, episode 20 of the uh, the Hockey Minds podcast, Spiros and Astis, episode 22, uh, Roy Stasiak, episode 63. Gentlemen, again, thank you very much for your time. I enjoyed this conversation and, and look forward to, to seeing you all again. Great. Thanks, Thanks, Matt. Much appreciated, Matt. Matt.